Welcome back to Beyond the Genetics. Today I have here with me Chiamaka. She's a nutritionist and a dietitian. She's a member of Little Soul of Mind Foundation. And she has someone um, that is very special to her who is a cell warrior. Chiamaka, thank you very much for being here and agreeing to do this. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here today. Okay, so can you tell me like how you heard about the foundation? Like what platform did you hear about us from? I actually heard from a friend, a friend who is a cell warrior, the special friend, yes. (laughs) Oh, is she a part of the foundation? Yes, he is. It's actually a he, not a she. He is a part of the foundation. Okay. All right, I had no idea about that. <laughs> so why did you decide to now join? Because the journey with him so far, like seeing his experiences, it just spurred in me the zeal to want to support other warriors who are actually going through a lot, but have pretty much a very little support system, especially in this part of the world, Africa here. So that's basically it. That's that's one of the driving factors for me. So that's your, he's sort of like your reason towards your passion. So can you tell us more about the relationship you have with this person? How is that relationship like? Okay, he's a very good friend. We are classmates in our undergraduate days. I call him my son. He calls me mother, although he's older. But then we, we were close like that. So how would you describe him as a person? He's a very resilient person. Though he doesn't even believe it himself, or he's a go-getter, he's an achiever. He's a very bright, intelligent, and resourceful person. And so far, I'm super proud of his achievements. How long have you guys been friends for? We've been friends for close to seven years now. Okay, that's, a long, that's quite a long time. So how would you describe your, when you first found out that he was a cell warrior, was it a conversation that you guys had? How did you find out? I think I found out from one of our other close friends, because we are um, a sort of group who would always hang out together. It wasn't a one-on-one conversation. I can't really remember anyways how I found out, but I think I found out from one of our other close friends. Before you found out that he had sickle cell disease, how much did you know about sickle cell? I didn't know so much. I just knew the basics that every other person knows. That um, sicklers are usually thinner. They are usually SS people. I didn't know the full story anyways. That's, that's what I'm trying to establish. So you had little knowledge on sickle cell yeah before you found out that he had sickle cell. Yes. So what was your take on warriors before you found out? Because you didn't have as much knowledge, but at least you knew something. You knew that, okay, something like this existed. So what was your take on warriors then before you actually found out that, oh, this friend of yours has sickle cell disease? My opinion of cell warriors was pretty inconclusive because... I feel you never know the full story until you are close enough. Okay. And then, yeah, that. yeah I, I kind of understand that. So it's just a situation where, you know, you just sort of had this needful knowledge on it and then that was about it. Yes, I didn't want to draw conclusions, make deductions that might possibly not be true since I wasn't close enough to anyone. It wasn't something I could just say, okay, this is what these people are like when I did not exactly know the full story firsthand. Mm-hmm. I can understand that. So then after you now found out, how was how did you now look at Warriors? Finding out about his situation made him more endearing to me, as well as other Warriors, because I just feel they are really strong people, really strong. It's, it's not an easy thing to deal with. And did it sort of like have any effects on your the dynamics of your relationship? As I said, it endeared him more to me. Did not have any negative impact because it just gave me the sense of responsibility to want to be there for him more 
then I already was. And how close exactly is your relationship with this person that you have mentioned? Like I said earlier, it was pretty much a mother, <laughs> a mother-son relationship, as cheesy as that sounds. We were friends, but I was pretty more like, as I said, we were a group too. I was pretty more like the mother of the group. So he was one of the children. <laughs> you understand, right? So that was pretty much the relationship we have that we still have since his mother. <laughs> Let me see. So that's it. Mm-hmm. And then going through this sort of like journey with him, because you guys you sound quite close and going through this journey with him, it affects you as well as a person. And do you feel like it's ever, does it ever feel like a body? No, not at all. So it never feels like, oh, this is quite draining to have to go through. Because you have your emotional stress as well from it, you know, different from what the person is actually going to going through. Because when you love someone that is in pain, not even just sickle cell now, you sort of like feel it as well. So it never for once felt draining. For me, I would say when you put it like that, it's a roller coaster, basically. Especially during the crisis period when I feel helpless to the helpless. I don't know if you get that feeling like, you know, he's helpless, but I feel helpless because I don't know what to do to make him better except be there for him and just do the little I can. So I will, I wouldn't say that is draining per se because as much as I can, I'm trying to be strong for him too. Because there's something I, I understand about support systems. Support system systems ensure that people that are going through certain periods of their time, uh, of their lives, are able to draw strength from other people within that system. If you want to be supportive to somebody and you don't have that strength to give out, then I feel it's pretty baseless. I feel it's pretty baseless. So I wouldn't say it's draining. Because I know I cannot be drained if I'm drained. There's nothing I have to give out to him. So that's it, basically. For me. It's just a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even like even from a cell warrior's view, from my own view, it's really is a roller coaster. That that seems like the perfect description that you can give to this whole process because it's just really it's a lot physically, financially, mentally. It just hits every part of your life. So now we all these like experiences and being there for him and all of that. Can you recall any scary crisis experience that he has had that you had to experience with him and help him through that process? Okay, one I can vividly remember, I cannot forget it. It was a very painful period for me. It was during our, ex- I think our third year, third year, first semester. We were writing semester exams and then the crisis struck. That exam when he had to struggle to come and write the exams. But then he just couldn't sit through it and he had to leave without completing the exams. In fact, he missed I think about five exams because of that crisis. And you know what the system is like? The school system was pretty inconsiderate. There were no makeups, no makeup exams, no makeup anything. He had to have an extra semester because of that. It was just a really painful experience because I'm like, the system should understand. It's already a difficult journey trying to go to school with all of the surrounding circumstances and then this person is intelligent it's not like he's a dollar it's evident that this person is intelligent but the system is doing nothing to support their journey i don't know if you understand what i mean for him it's draining already going to school with everything but then that little support it wouldn't have killed anyone if makeup exams were fixed just so he could at least graduate with his mates so it was it was really painful because I knew he was bearing consequences for something he had no control of totally. Yeah. I mean that's such a sad story because he has put so much time and dedication into trying to study for, for an exam and then now having 
you know, sickle cell come out of nowhere. It's sort of like <laughs> the hindrance on all the hard work that you have just done. And then there's nothing that is in place in the system for when things like that happen and you have to now suffer the consequences. But like you, like you rightly put something that you have no control about and something that you did not even choose for yourself. Like, because exams are one of the periods where like a lot of warriors break down, especially those that are sort of like really go deep into studying. And mm-hmm. it's one of the periods that it's an immense amount of stress. You know, I have had experiences of trying to study for exams, like being a doctor and writing like board exams and things like that is a lot on your body. And when you get to that part where you finally put in the work and it's time for your exam and your body is just like, nah, we're not doing this today. And you actually have no, no control over that. Like I have exams that I have been in pain writing exams, but I just had to show up. Because first of all, I didn't even want to go through the whole process of trying to write later to this person and talk to that person of maybe, maybe, you know, my exam can be pushed and all. Like I just take it and call there and try to write it. But sometimes that's not even possible and there's nothing that you can do about that. Oh, goodness. Okay. So what would be your take on how sickle cell patients are being treated? Because they still, in as much as right now, compared to, you know, past times, there's more knowledge now on disease. People are being more informed, but still, not a lot of people still have adequate information on what this disease entails. And what's your take on how sickle cell patients are being treated in hospitals? Because I assume that you've gone to the hospital with him before and also in the society as a whole as well. What's your take on how super cell patients are being treated? Unfairly would be the word. Did you get that? Unfairly would be the word if, if I was asked to describe that in one word. Unfairly. Because in the hospitals, they are scarcely given the much needed attention. The attention they need so much to ensure that they are comfortable and properly cared for. You don't get that. Then the society, hmm, the stigma is, is on another level. So you feel like there's still a lot of discrimination going on. There's these warriors, like, they actually chose this battle they fight. That's how I see it. Especially in this part of the world, here in Africa. It's just really crazy like that. Yeah. And how has this whole experience that you've had, how has it sort of, like, affected your life? How has it made any impact in your life? It has made me become more perceptive towards life, what people go through to actually stay alive. You know, it's uh, pretty, I'm looking for the word, it's pretty draining knowing that you might not live to a ripe old age. Such that even on your birthday is when people are saying, I wish you long life and prosperity, you know, that's possibly a fast. And that might never happen, like knowing you're going to die at any time, that you might die at any time if you don't properly manage yourself. Most times, even when you properly manage yourself and your body's just saying, we can't do this anymore. It has just made me more perceptive towards life, knowing that every moment counts and you just have to give every moment a treasured memory, something to keep in store. I don't know if this makes sense, but that's how I see it, basically. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, like, even not just for sickle cell patients, like everybody, we actually do not know how long or short our lives are going to be. Mm. So every moment is treasured. Every moment should be, you know, spent with the people that you love. And if anything, especially in this period of just going through a pandemic that has taught me personally a lot in terms of having to put my time into things that are actually worth it. So it does make sense what you have said and I can 100% relate to that as well. So you are a nutritionist and um, a dietitian. 
So how is diet and proper nutrition important in the life of a soil warrior? Okay, like I always say, even on my podcast, my nutrition podcast, I felt to this, like I would always say, nutrition and diet is not just a one fixed solution to everything. You understand? It's, yeah. it's not a one hat fits all solution too. What works for this person might not work for this person and might not work for the other person. And nutrition and, the, um, and diet isn't a standalone option. There are so many other things that have to be in place. Diet and lifestyle improvement, however, an essential key in the man- management of this disease, not just during crisis periods too. That's something key to note. Like I always tell people, nutrition is not just about what you eat and what you drink. Nutrition is a holistic science. What you listen to, what you see, everything you feed your entire being with. And you wonder why I say so. Having sickle cell disease on its own is depressing. So when you listen to music that is depressing too, one way or the other, either by the kind of beats, the vibes it gives you, you are just setting yourself up for another very serious problem. Or when you watch really depressing things. I don't know if, if you understand what I'm saying. So for me, nutrition is more holistic than food and drinks because all of those things actually affect, they drive what you eat and drink. If you're watching something sad or something depressing, there is a likelihood that you might binge eat. That is, and binge eating majorly has to do with all of your unhealthy stuff. You might want to do junk. You might want to do very unhealthy things, basically, which is not good for any cell warrior. So nutrition is something that has to be looked into holistically. Diet, lifestyle, they are very important. And like I said, not only during crisis periods, because if you are waiting to your crisis before you take responsibility of nutrition the way I have said it, then you might just have a problem to deal with. So are there any specific foods that are better for warriors? Basically, what warriors need, they just need to keep increasing their iron stores. Their iron stores from supplements, it could be your normal over-the-counter supplements that you could get, the basic type, just to ensure that your iron um, stores are always good enough to sustain you. Your green leafy vegetables, foods that are really rich in, and also knowing how to take these foods too, because it's also one thing to know the foods that okay. Let Let's take the instance of you knowing that combining your iron rich legumes with vitamin C sources will actually make them more bioavailable for your body. If you didn't know that, you possibly might not take them as well as you should take them and then you'll be underutilizing these foods that are available to you. I don't know if you understand. Like you take beans and you know that, okay, oh, as I'm thinking maybe rice and beans with stew and fish <laughs> or whatever else it is you want to have with your food. Now possibly having an orange juice after that meal will make the iron in the beans plantain because these foods actually have this iron in trace levels. So if, if knowing that if you could take a vitamin C, an orange juice rather, after that meal would boost how available the iron in the food is to your body, then I feel you'll be able to better utilize that food rather than undermine its use. Yeah, I understand that. So what's your take on um Ugo? Are you familiar? I assume you're familiar with it. So what's your take on it? Because on Ugu in boosting the hemoglobin of sickle cell patients, because a lot of African families tend to like blend it and sort of like make a, a smoothie or, or some sort, some like add it to their smoothies and some just blend it and make a drink out of it. I know my mom used to do it for me a lot and I hate it. So what's your take on it actually boosting hemoglobin? Okay, pumpkin, that's ugu, locally known as ugu by the Igbo people. It's a rich source, but something, like I said, the Jesus is not a one heart fits all. 
there are a lot of other green leafy vegetables that are available to us in this part of the world in Nigeria. Just improve the food variety. Don't make the diet monotonous. When your sickle cell child knows that you're always going to give ogu and the child doesn't like it, like you did not like it, the child will always dredge those times. But then if you could make it more fun, like you could maybe put in a little bit of to spice it up a bit if you are juicing. So maybe you add some milk. Make it fun. You could combine it with other fruits or vegetables. You could add a bit of spinach. African spinach is green. I'm, I'm saying this local name so people are able to better relate. Because if I say spinach, somebody's wondering, where do I want to find spinach in the local market? Green. It goes by that local name. Then there's fruited pumpkin. There's one that's called Hospital Too Far. There's pumping blood. There are a variety of green leafy vegetables that you could always switch, have, um, make fun recipes from. It just shouldn't be bland ugu. <laughs> bland ugu that is uninteresting. I don't know if you get the point I'm trying to make. Sure. Yeah, I understand that, but I honestly don't know how ugu would go with mixture with milk, Because that just sounds like a disaster. <laughs> That's just drink. Okay, it actually isn't. You could try. You could, if if you have a high quality blender, you could make it. <laughs> if if you have a high quality blender, you could make the ugu into a smoothie. And you're just saying you wouldn't try it because you don't like ugu to even start with. You see the smell. That that smell has been imprinted in my brain, and if I sight it from miles away, I'm already like all the memories are coming back, and I just can't deal with it. Now I can't deal with that, and then you're not telling me to. Try it with milk. It just sounds wrong in my head, honestly. That's what I'm saying. So most times, too, someone else will have to kick out these preconceived notions, too, because it will also limit the amount of nutrients you're supposed to get. Like, now we are, we are totally ruling off ugu juices and smoothies, too. Now you're missing out on what you could possibly get from that. I think another thing that makes it smell awfully is when... The African parents now add steamed tomatoes to it. I don't know if you had that experience. Well, I didn't have I ugu with steamed tomatoes and maltina. Personally, I don't even like the smell of ugu and steamed tomatoes together. It just puts me off. When African parents make these things, they want to force it down your truth, whether you like it or not. You don't even know. I mean, at the end of the day, right, it's just a way to sort of, like, help you. I mean, that, yeah. that's what they are thinking is. That's what I'm saying. As much as you are trying to help that cell warrior, make the process more interesting. Read about other amazing recipes you could try. Read about other interesting foods that even the ones that are not common to you. Many foods are being exported to and from different countries these days. Another thing is because most of us, we are so used to certain kinds of food, so we don't even want to try the other ones. We say, okay, this one has been working for me over time. Why do I need to switch? But if you have these preconceived notions, you'll be limiting yourself from... And this is not just for cell warriors, for every other person. You don't have a narrow mind. Open up your mind to several other things, you, you'll be surprised what you could find out. How would, how can, because in certain situations, right, especially when um, you're going through a crisis or you're recovering from a crisis and sometimes your appetite is, is as shitty as you can get, because I know I've experienced this quite a number of times, like during crisis, I can't eat anything. And, you know, after a crisis as well, usually I just, it's watermelon. There are two things I can take during a crisis period is watermelon. That's my breakfast, lunch, dinner. And Ribena, that's like my breakfast, lunch, dinner as well. So it's either watermelon or Ribena. So I know that there are situations where like appetite is very low and it takes time. Sometimes it takes like weeks, two weeks, three weeks to get your appetite back. So how can a salary maintain a good diet, especially in those periods of where you really don't feel like eating anything. Okay. First things, food preferences. Find out what works for that warrior. Like you just said, you like watermelon, you like ribena. 
try as much as you can to incorporate other foods, one way or the other, into what the person likes. I will still go back to the milk I was talking about before. It might not be animal milk. It might be something more nutrient dense, like um, soy milk. You could actually make a smoothie of the watermelon, add soy milk to it. Soy milk has, it has some fats, it has proteins, it has micronutrients too. So in one smoothie, you could be having a balanced diet, even when you're not eating salt and pepper. <laughs> I don't know if you understand. So that's something um the caregiver or the cell warrior should be able to understand too. Watermelon works for this person. I've just given person bland watermelon. There is not an adequate diet at that time. And then we talked about um getting these supplements too. Supplements also help boost the appetite. I, I don't exactly want to recommend any particular brand because like I said, something that works for this person might not work for the other person. So I, I'm not exactly keen on recommending brands. It is find find something that works for you. Like for you now, watermelon works. And watermelon is a good way to also boost your appetite too because one, it's um, hydrating and it has vitamins and minerals that also help stimulate your appetite. But for someone else, it might be cookies. You understand what I'm saying? It might be something zero calorie. But for somebody like that, what I would suggest is try as, as much as possible to, what I recommend is try as much as possible to make juices of fruit juices. Now, I'm not saying smoothies because person might not be able to tolerate smoothies, especially immediately after a crisis or during a crisis. Crisis. Try to make juices that can pass easily. Like person can just take like a free liquid. Try to take very nutrient dense juices. So you know, would provide the calories, the nutrients that that person needs. Or you could give very light grills, like pap. You could give pap, make it really light, but still make it as nutrient dense as possible. <laughs> now, there are very interesting pap recipes that are used for complementary feeding. You don't like ugo and milk, so I don't know how this one will sound. I actually what? don't even like Papsel, so don't even attempt to recommend anything. <laughs> okay, so I'm not recommending Pap to you, but like I said, find what works for you. That's why you need to always consult with a nutritionist so you can always work around your food preferences and nutritionists will be able, based on your diet history too, nutritionists will be able to find, um, um, develop a regimen that, that would be suitable for you. And their nutrition is pretty much everywhere. But then I'm not saying we are consult just anybody. The setting that the nutrition they are consulting is credible and reliable. You could reach out to nutritionists online. You could reach out to them physically. But most times, physical stress is just something else. So technology has made it pretty easy for us these days. And then the cell warrior too. Do your own research. So you don't just buy everything. The nutritionist tells you who clean and sinker. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah. So with your experience now, with all the experience that you've had, with having someone that you care about with sickle cell, and then with being a nutritionist and having to speak to sickle cell patients as well. So what would be the one message you would like to pass to people that are listening? The one message I would like to pass to first is cell work. You need a resilient spirit to conquer this war. A resilient spirit, basically, that's what you need. If you have that, you always move forward and not backward. Resilient spirit is what you need. Then to the rest of everybody, still is a resilient spirit. That's what you need. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever you're battling, always stay positive. Things might not turn out how you wish, but through it all, try to find the positives and not dwell on the negatives because dwelling on the negatives never help. Yeah. Shemaka, thank you very much for being here and thank you for taking out time from your day to do this episode with me. It was definitely informative and I'm really grateful that you could, you know, be on the show. All right. Thank you too. Thank you very much for having me. 
All right, everyone, we've come to the end of Beyond the Genetics. Thank you for listening and see you next time. Bye.